We will now go on to our information items. So it's time to talk about buildings, everyone. Uh, our first item is the Capital Improvement Plan Framework. Dr. Murphy. Yes, I'm going to turn to uh, Ms. Stingle here to uh, start this presentation. I know she also has some staff with her. Uh, but I'm also going to make note that this is building on the last presentation we heard at the previous board meeting with the Arlington Facility Student and Accommodation Plan. So that was a little bit of the backdrop of information that we provided. This is then going to build on the CIP framework that you're going to hear about tonight and then as a follow-up uh, as an action item at our next meeting. And then with my announcements earlier, I made mention that after the school board adopts its regular budget, we'll move into um, the CIP and begin that planning process. So Ms. Stingle, I'll turn it to you at this point. So thank you. And um, Robert Ruiz is also here tonight. He's helping lead the um, CIP process for APS. Also, um, Stacy Snyder's here from FAC, and we did a lot of work with that group. This first slide, actually, I apologize. It was something that I worked on yesterday in response to a question from the school board. Um, somehow in the transition from a snow day to a regular day, I dropped this from the PowerPoint when we sent it in. Uh, it, just a clarification about something that came up in the AFSAP that we presented at the last meeting. I think a couple of, uh, some people are reading into this and I wanted to, to just remind everybody that the AFSAP and how we approached it this year is sort of a planning document for us. It, it's, it's documenting what we're thinking and how we're approaching it. And I wanted to make really a, a clear statement that option schools are essential to how we're managing growth and enrollment across APS. I know that in the um, document, some people have read that APS intends to fill some of our schools. Our intent is not to overfill any school in disproportion to the other schools serving those same levels. We want to make sure that we're spreading students across schools as much as we can and use those schools to help us. Um, we'll use the projections annually um, for the following school year and again, um, just determine whether or not we need to make adjustments, either growing or reducing the number of classes at an option school. We've, um, in this first go around, when this has been under my office, the growth has been framed by adding a class at the entry grade level and then um, it remains within the limits defined by the facilities optimization study. And again, this is a new process for us. It's sort of laying out these um, annual update steps that came out of the options and transfer policy changes. And we're going to be looking at them and making probably some adjustments next year as we learn what works and what, you know, what we need to um, make adjustments to. Um, and thank you to Jeremy for slipping in the slide. I apologize. We'll make sure that Ms. Elliott gets it and it's posted on board docs. So now the presentation that deals with the CIP framework. Um, again, we, um, we had two meetings with FAC members to go through, or with a subset of FAC members, to go through um, some of the materials for the, um, the upcoming CIP. And what we did at the last meeting was we looked at those estimates for the um, next 10 years based on the fall projections and we proposed some short-term and non-capital adjustments to balance enrollment and identified additional needs to begin to talk about what we're doing in the CIP framework. This is my first time jumping into it and what, and what it is is we're laying out tonight the priorities and the timelines based on the projections and, and what we um, reviewed with FAC. In the, April, we'll begin to get estimated costs for potential capital projects, and then we'll also get um, our bonding capacity from our finance department. So just a refresher, I'm not gonna go through this list, but these are the projects that are in our current CIP and the status of where they are today. And again, you saw this at the last meeting. This is a snapshot of enrollment, and as our graduating classes are leaving, those student, the bars in gray, our classes that follow them are bigger, and as we look on out to the incoming classes, our estimates say we, you know, we expect to have most classes above 2,000 students as we move um, through this cycle. So now to sort of lay out the information. So what you're seeing here is um, our, our elementary projections. And the first blue bar shows actually enrollment on September 30th in a comparison in green to the number of students who actually um, were projected last year. So you see our projections were actually pretty decent and as, and as you compare the two, it hasn't changed a lot um, from last year. So as we look at this and in the work with, with FAC, what we see is in 2024, um, enrollment levels are actually manageable with re relocatables. We have uh, an elementary school planned for 2025 and as we started to look at 
what we're experiencing today and what we expect to be experiencing based on the current projections. Is there some room and how do we think about these needs? In 2025, enrollment is again manageable relocatables. What we also sense is if it's concentrated in a couple schools, it's not comfortable. So it really depends on how it's being balanced across schools. And then in 2026, enrollment levels are similar to what we're seeing this year. And if those estimates remain the same, we have to have a school at that point. Doing the same sort of look at our middle school enrollment, you'll see actually our projections pretty much stay the same from the previous year, not a lot of change. And so as we look again at enrollment compared to the number of seats that are planned, what we see is that enrollment in 2022, 2023, and 2024, those numbers can probably be managed with relocatables. It may be uncomfortable again if enrollment is concentrated in a couple schools. If it's across all of the schools, it's a different situation than if it's at one or two. And if those estimates remain the same as we update them next year, then we will need additional seats. So high school enrollment is actually where we saw some changes in our projections. Um, when you look at um, what enrollment was, it was this fall and compare it to last year's projections, it went down. We noticed within the data that we had fewer ninth grade students and we typically, we typically get about 10%, uh, we get about 10% of new students coming into it. And I'm not sure if it's moving from parochial schools and private schools into the public school system, but, but that number went down this year. I think it was around five or 6%. Um, and then as you look on out, you see our projections change. And I think some of this relates to the data that we talked about at the last meeting, the, the, the information that we're getting from the county on our housing um, pipeline um, forecasts. So with high school, we see some changes. And right now, this slide shows our, um, if the, the CIP included 1,300 seats, last spring you made a decision that if, uh, to add the education center and the career center. We made a couple adjustments to the slide based on some questions from a school board member. So let me walk through those. So in 2021, when we planned to add the ed center, what you see is we're actually doing pretty good with seats. You've done, there's been a lot of things put in place to actually plan ahead and make sure we have enough permanent seats at the current class size level for our students. In 2022, we actually have, you know, still a manageable size that we can um, control through, again, through relocatables. It's not too much of a burden when you look across our schools or, you know, at high schools would probably be in the 100s or low 100s that it would be fine still. So in 2023-24, um, if the estimates remain constant, that's when it begins to be difficult to manage enrollment with re relocatables. And that's when we're thinking the career center, there might be a little room there to rethink the timing on the career center. Um, so what we did was we actually um, updated the presentation today to show this. So this shows what would it look like if we added 800 seats in 2022 at the career center. And you see that um, we're in pretty good shape if we do it that year. We have more seats, the yellow bar um, above the number, of, the number of students have enrolled. If we move it out a year, we actually are closer. We still have more seats than we need. You know, this is where we start to um, need to begin pulling on seats. 800 seats right at this point gets to be, um, we need those. So what we looked at here is, oh, sorry. This was an extra slide that didn't go out. Um, so the continuing projects, we've put those back in here. So fleet, we continue on track with that. The Montessori move to Drew has to happen. We don't have another place to put those seats at this time. The Wilson HB Woodlawn Stratford program move is on track. The Stratford um, opens as a new middle school in 2019. So we have a lot of projects in the queue that happen then. And then Reed is underway and a lot of work is being done on the BLPC. So a lot of decisions are being made. Again, this is what we looked at with FAC. So I'm not gonna go into the numbers, but as we begin to look at some of the flexibility of when we might bring on some of the seats. Um, at high school, we're assuming that, you know, if we bring on the Ed Center in 2021, uh, it provides some flexibility. You know, maybe, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. 800 seats at the Career Center then might have a little bit of a range of when we could bring them on. And I know that group has been talking, if they could actually find more seats, I think that's where we get the flexibility, maybe reusing the building here. 
Um, at the middle school level, this is the time range between 2022 and 2024 is when we're really going to need those seats. Um, and then at the elementary school level between 2025 and 2026 is when we're going to need it if our estimates continue to show the same trends that they're showing this year. Um, so what we've done in this is laid out really two options to begin to think about um, what could be the CIP projects based on um, priority. So both of them have a mix of pretty much the same. I think um, we have the refresh for both Drew and Henry, those schools as, as um, other programs move out and we, the Drew becomes a full neighborhood school and Montessori moves to the Henry building. We wanna make sure those are refreshed and um, good places for our kids to go in with nice new paint and floors it's done. The Ed Center, the Ed Center we have for five to 600 seats and that's here. That will take care of our high school capacity needs for a bit. Um, the middle school, the first option, this is where the difference is, has a middle school addition. We're probably gonna need 300 seats around 2022, 23. And the other, if you look at the second option, we actually suggest that if we can get more seats at the Career Center, is there an option to reuse this for middle school seats, reuse the Ed Center for middle school seats? So that's the big difference between the two. And um, down at the bottom, we have other capital projects, including the bus driver facility. That's just the facility where they go um, to check in and do some of their, their work. Um, instructional flex space at the buck. I know there's a request to get that in and we're getting cost on what that would take to use that for um, instructional space. Then there's also some um, needs for new fields, minor, major, minor construction and major maintenance. So this is the beginning of what we're proposing to put into this. As we get costs and as we get um, you know, our bonding capacity, this would be where our starting point for the CIP. Um, and the timeline for this is you will adopt the framework at the next school board meeting. Then on May 3rd, the superintendent will come back with a proposal. There are work sessions that were scheduled as part of the budget process and those are listed here. Then you do your, the school board's proposal is presented on June 7th with adoption on the 21st. And for community input, we'll, we're gathering in community input on these projects already. We did it through the 1300 seats last year. The Reed BLPC is addressing that project. The Career Center Working Group, there is community engagement going on through that continuously. And we'll be doing a uh, BLPC for the Education Center once the contract is signed and those steps begin to move forward. We'll also have opportunities for people to weigh in on the options um, after the super, superintendent's recommendation. So we expect that to be in May. Um, and we're beginning to post things on Engage to let people know what is, um, what we're presenting here tonight. That's it. Excellent. Uh, Ms. Elliott, do we have speakers? Yes, ma'am, we have two speakers on this item. The first is Stacy Snyder. Hello again. <laughs> um, I've uh, included a hard copy of my statement as well as um, the slides that we worked with staff to put together that were shown at our uh, March 12th FAC meeting. Um, it was very nice of Robert Ruiz to um, put the slides together for us, but those were based on FAC input. Um, as an advisory committee to you, the school board, we advocate for a perspective that takes into the consideration the needs of the entire school system and puts each decision into the context of how it impacts our seat needs as a whole at every school level and how it fits within our overall budget and bonding capacity. We understand the pressures of our growing enrollment and we aim to advise you to think long term and to make the most efficient, efficient use of every dollar and every site. The FAC has been working with APS staff over the past weeks to provide input on the CIP framework. A subcommittee met with staff twice and we discussed the CIP framework at our meeting on March 12th. We have looked closely at the projections and the timing to see enrollment growth and see enrollment growth at every level, which all require attention, planning and money to address. The outcome from our meetings was to identify a one to three year time frame in which we think consideration to be given, should be given to adding capacity for each school level. We did not propose options, however, because we, we think it's important to wait for the financial piece to know the amount of funding that will be 
potentially available within our bonding capacity for all the planned and needed projects. Based on the projections and timing and seat need, we identified um, the seat needs as follows. For elementary school, uh, we see um, it's important to add uh, 725 seats in 2025 or 2026. We see a need for additional middle school capacity in 2022, 2023, or 2024. And we see a need for 500 to 600 high school seats in 2021 and an additional 700 to 800 in 2023, 2024, or 2025. The FAC therefore advocates for looking at the seat need for all levels in the CIP and recommends that the plans describe solutions, including potentially creative solutions, that yield additional seats on time and on budget. It is also important to consider that as building costs are currently rising for planned projects, they will likely rise for further and future projects. We should look to mitigate this problem by examining ways to control costs and finding efficiencies in the di design process to save time and money. Additional support from the county in coordination and integrated integration of long range planning will also be a great value to APS and to the county. We would also like to urge you to see how each project fits into a long term plan and to understand that if a decision is made for this CIP, what the next steps might be. We urge that every decision is made transparently in the context of understanding impacts to our overall seat need and how it fits into the overall budget. It is important to show your work and to show the community what our constraints are and allow everyone to make a decision that explicitly recognizes the trade-offs and the impacts to all of Arlington. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Lois Koontz. Madam Chairwoman, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Murphy. Um, I do sit on the fact that I'm here speaking for myself. Uh, as context, last year the fact developed a report looking for high school seats, looking at all APS sites to see where we could build. Uh, this fall the facilities staff came out with the site maximization study showing how many relocatable classrooms we could fit on APS properties at all levels. And while we don't count relocatable classrooms as permanent capacity, they do in essence redefine the capacity of our facilities. Even so, the FACT's newly, uh, newly released report makes clear that while we are using every short-term and long-range capacity tool available to us today, it won't be enough. I have two thoughts. The first is on process. We hope that the county's long-range planning will begin to incorporate this forward thinking for schools. And looking ahead, APS, APS may want to change our public processes, which are cumbersome, time-consuming, staff and citizen intensive, exhausting, expensive, and at worst, sometimes divisive. I believe we need to get better at our decision-making. The second thought is on the subject of burden sharing. The likely scope of future school needs is formidable with pre predicted student population growth of 22% in the next 10 years alone. Add to that, construction costs are rising as much as 10% in a couple of years. Construction budgets that appeared reasonable as, re as recently as two years ago are now falling short of today's cost projections. So, whoa, uh, we can't build our way out of the long-term crunch, but I would urge all of us to think like Arlingtonians, leaving our self-interests, not letting them not oppose the core values of equity and fiscal responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board colleagues, questions and comments? Ms. Talento. Thank you, Ms. Stengel, for the presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, can we go to slide 19? Uh, I just wanted to, uh, for option two, I just wanted to confirm with, 
um, that if we did the, if we repurpose the Ed Center for middle school seats, then we really do not have flexibility as to when we bring on the high school seats. 2023 would be, because we would not have the 500 seats in 2022. Is that correct? So we would be at a deficit in 2023 that would be about seven or 800. I don't have the numbers in Say front of me. Say that for high school seats or middle school seats? High school seats. Okay. So in option two, we're looking at repurposing the Ed Center for middle school. And then a thousand seats at the, a thousand plus seats at the Career Center. So that means that we did not have high school seats at the Ed Center, correct? So the thinking on this was we've, we've so there's a couple of community engagement processes going on. The read, I think the, one of the interesting things that came out of some of the early pieces of the read design was there was a proposal that actually had more seats that were a lower cost per seat. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think sometimes when we're laying out these projects, if we don't necessarily give a we're building to this, if we if we expand it to see, are there, is there a potential to get, you know, more bang for our buck um, by building a little bit bigger and thinking a little bit more um, strategically? If we could actually find more, the other pieces I've heard the Career Center Working Group. I've sat in those meetings and I think one of the things I've heard them say is build it bigger. We know those students are gonna come, let's do it. You know, so part of this was thinking if we could somehow get more seats, you know, by delaying this a little bit and giving more bonding capacity over two years, could we do it so the Ed Center could serve sort of what um, the Wilson Building, the old Wilson Building used to do. We used to have a swing space where when schools were going through renovations at that time, could move out and move into it. And maybe this could serve as that until we, you know, have the funds to build a, another building. So that was sort of the thinking okay. on that instead but of an addition. Right, and, and I understand that piece, but I just want to make sure that I'm also looking at our numbers correctly. In 2023, if we have not built the 500 seats at the Ed Center, then we are at a higher deficit in 2023. In yes. other words, yes. when we build the 500 seats at, in 2021, we're in a good place with our high school capacity. Yes. And so in 2023, if we do not build those Ed Center seats, we are, we are not in a good place with capacity. We're probably like an 800 seat deficit. Yeah, and I'm I don't have that, but I'm just trying to guess at the numbers. So I just want to. Yeah, the Ed Center has been part of this thinking, and and when right. we did that siting process last spring, part of it was it brought on those seats earlier. Right. We saw a big demand last year, and our projections have shown that it's not quite as severe as it was. Okay. Um, but we need seats in 2021. And the reason I was asking that is because, uh, as the Career Center Working Group liaison, I do find value in being able to buy the, that project some time with the funding to really build it. And, and this is just what I'm hearing just for the public purpose. The committee has not come up with any recommendations. They're in dialogue. They have many ideas, um, a lot of conversation. But I'm just trying to look at it from a school board member's perspective and funding. Right. We have to fund whatever project they, they recommend and we approve however that may be approved. And so in option two, we lose the flexibility of pushing it out to 2024, and we are in a crunch at high school seats in 2023 because we have not used the Ed Center seats for secondary seats. I in that, that's how I'm viewing it, and I just wanted to confirm that that is a correct perception, and maybe it isn't, so. I think. But I would like to look at yes, it and that's, actually that's respond fine. later. No, yeah, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. But that's what I'm yep. seeing, and that would be helpful to me to understand so that as we move forward in the CIP process, I know the, the consequences of looking at option two as a possibility for moving forward with the CIP framework. Thank Ms. Talento, I, I, I don't think we quite followed that. Are you saying the Ed Center, you don't, in option two, the Ed Center, you don't expect it to be used for high school? It says right there, at 2023, Career Center 1000 Plus. Repurpose Ed Center for middle school. Oh, at that point in 2023. But right. in 2021, it would be used for high school. Okay, to, that's where to, I'm confusing. So we would have high school seats. Yes, sorry. The Ed okay. Center is there in both. It Thank just, you for that. It changes its use. Sorry about that. I no, no, it's okay because I was, so it really does become true swing pace swing space until we find a way to build a new middle school. And if we build it that way, I think we do, I think the work that was done last spring on the Ed Center means we probably build it for 500 seats and so that it allows for different things to fit in there, which Thanks. has the common spaces that wouldn't be if we built it for okay, 600. Okay, so then we're, we're in a similar place. We're just repurposing it as a swing space and looking at how we can Yeah, do it's sort of a different way of thinking more. about how we use the resources we have. and. 
And then we could gain flexibility and still maybe do 2024 with the Career Center, as you showed in another slide. That's so helpful. And thank you, Dr. Cannon, for catching that. I did not see that piece. Thank you. Ms. O'Grady. Thank you. I have a follow-up on Ms. Talento's question. So, Ms. Stengel, if we were to start off in 2021 and add five to 600, or five to 600 students at the Ed Center, and then two years later decide that those students have to go somewhere else, and we're going to put middle school students in that location, what was the thought process? Would we be having kids switch out in the middle of high school to go to a different school? To How would we handle that for those students? It probably would be like we did with boundaries this last year. I think one of the things that we would consider is grandfathering students who are there, but as students are moving in, having them go to you know, the new school. I think we'd, do, we'd probably end up doing a couple boundary changes as much as that. Um, it's not necessarily the way I'd want to do, but I think temporarily it might be a fix. Um, so you do a boundary change as you open the Ed Center and maybe expand Washington Lee, give students access to a comprehensive high school, and then come back and as the Career Center opens, you know, you draw boundaries for four high schools. Okay, so we would potentially see those students moving to starting a high school experience in one location and then ending in a different one. You know, that probably, probably some students would do it, but when we did the high school boundary process, we actually grandfathered students. So if they were already enrolled, they stayed, but as those new students were coming through, they moved to the new school. Um, and given the program that's there and given that there's already students there, some of the issues that we saw in the high school boundary process don't apply in the same way. I, I think as we looked at siting last year, during those schools, those standalone schools with 1,300 seats, they wouldn't have upperclassmen there when they go there or anybody else. It'd be, you know, starting at grade nine. And so this is actually a way to think about how we, you know, there's already a program there and students there. so. I would bet some of the students in the neighborhood might take advantage of the move, others might not, but we could be, you know, we learn how to be creative. I think we have to be creative with some of these changes that are coming up. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Goldstein, do you have questions? I do. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Lisa. Um, uh, so can we, can you help me with the whole notion of the framework? So everything we're seeing here is the framework. So I had been thinking that framework was kind of um, the timetable and the understanding what the leftover projects from the last CIP were and knowing what the bonding capacity was and stuff like this. But this is real content stuff. So is this the stuff that we will, you'll be asking us to approve uh, whenever it is, April or something? So these are the projects that right now we're getting costs for. These are projects that are, have been discussed in other places and they align with the previous CIP and then the discussions we've had from the, um, with, with FAC as we've looked at this stuff. Um, you know, the framework is really the projections data there was, I put in a timeline for the, uh, for the next meetings that we'll be having and when we bring information back to the school board and the work sessions that we'll be working through, but this is our starting point. A lot of these projects are underway. Other ones from the last CIP, as we've reassessed and looked at projections, I think we've, we've got some adjustments we can make. And so this is sort of what we're saying we should bring to the table as that starting point. Ooh, okay, but I mean, I see a lot of, um on a couple of previous slides, you know, maybe this and maybe this, and you know, maybe if we did it this way, we'd end up with that. So um, that's the part I'm not clear on of what what fits into what defines the framework. Uh, you understand what I'm asking? I understand what you're asking. Okay. Yeah. The <clears throat> I'm go I'm going to ask Ms. Peterson maybe to help with this because. It's an iterative process. And what we are not sharing with you this evening, because it's a framework, are the financials. So what Ms. Stingle has shared initially with the projections and the student enrollment data is really the rationale. This is what the landscape looks like. This is what we think you might be needing. And these are some of the choices 
that we see that could play out across each one of the levels. I do want to take the opportunity to also point out, and I think someone raised it, um, Ms. Snyder raised it when she mentioned the planning process, is that it takes us five years to plan once we begin a project. So we're seeing that as um, you know, quite a task in how we then look at how the funds are distributed over that time period or the bond funds are distributed over that time period. So what Ms. Stingle has really done is she said, here's the rationale based on what our enrollment is today and what our projections are telling us. Here are the choices that you have for how these things could integrate. We're going to come back to you once we start with the CIP process and begin to lay out how the funds need to be distributed. And then within that, there will also be some tuning. Right now, though, with how the, the bond funding is laid out and then the referendum that comes forward, many of your out years are simply just for planning. You're projecting of what your funds or your bond funding will need to be in those out years. And you are forecasting, but those funds we will not be going to the voters necessarily and asking for those in particular projects. Ms. Peterson, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, or clarify anything that I've, I've stated. Uh, I think the only thing that I would add is that um, the, the choices that you have in front of you are going to be very strictly defined by how much money you have to spend. And once we figure out how much money you have to spend, it will then narrow down the choices you can make. Okay, thank you because I think my next comment fits into that perfectly. And that is a comment or question. I, I didn't see it in here, but I could have missed it. Are you considering as a um, option or uh, idea increasing utilization of existing buildings? So in what way? Two Years, last, two years ago when we did the CIP, I suggested that we do uh, something called split shifts. Uh, and I didn't um, describe it well, I didn't make myself clear on it. First of all, it would only be at the high school level. And you know, secondly, it would only be for students who choose uh, a different schedule, but a schedule that would make greater use of the building in terms of you know, used hours. Um, are you considering, let, let me rephrase that, I, I'd like to see some ideas on that uh, because that could fit into, you know, our whole notion of what we're spending, how much we're spending when, and uh, how many seats we're going to be able to accommodate by doing so. And there would be a wide variety, I'll take that question, yeah. there would be a wide variety of considerations that we could bring to the table on that. Sure. The idea of the split shift would be one. The other is uh, increasing class size as, as another sure. uh, potential option. So I'm just putting all the different scenarios that could possibly play themselves out on the table. Right. We've seen class size, you know, move over the years. Um, I don't think we've ever seen split shift as an idea and again you know our rapidly rising enrollment and as leslie pointed out constrained dollars are limiting our choices so you know this is a uh, configuration for want of a better word that um, i'd like to see explored right and i mean we can even go as far as do we need to have school buildings because of the future of what public education may or may not look like is, is something that we should be thinking out about as well. I, I agree. I agree. But, um, yeah. Okay. So where I think we're, if not on the same track and parallel tracks, then. So I guess I'd like to hear from other board members, yeah. maybe not tonight, but if this is something that you want us to consider uh, with, um, you know, we, future we will discussion. have some discussions and and, yeah. and and consider providing guidance on that. Um, yes, I. It's always a, there's always a moment at a board meeting when I like to remind folks that when one board member makes a comment, it is not board direction; it is one board member's thinking, and we will collaborate and possibly 
um, come to a, a mutual conclusion on things. But sometimes we share ideas, and that's what they are. Uh, who's next? Uh, well, I'm not done. Oh, okay, Mr. Goldstein. Thanks. Uh, hi, can you go to slide seven, please? Is that, yeah, okay, thanks. So um, do we have an idea of which geographic areas uh, we'll be seeing greater you know, enrollment growth in? Looking at it at the moment, no, but that is something that we're looking into as we're talking with FAC, we're, trying, we're, we're, we're beginning to dig in and actually look at it um, more in regional areas. And is in that digging in, are you, cons I'm sorry? I, actually, I meant not FAC, JFAC. Some of the uh. work that they're doing is looking at where is the growth occurring. Okay, and so uh, is it fair to presume that they're taking into consideration or you all are taking into consideration um, county development plans? In our projections? In that idea of where geographically we'll be, able, we'll be seeing greater enrollment growth. So we have, yeah, uh, the uh, development is actually in the projections and we've been, I've been part of this since September. So um, we're beginning to dig in and, and actually look at the data differently to begin to say, where is the growth gonna occur? I know that that school that I think is in 2025 was discussed during the South Arlington Working Group at a specific site. You know, before we go on and say this is where it needs to be, we need to go back and look and actually go down to where the growth is occurring. So we, we don't know that today. We are gonna be working that on that over the course of the summer. Yeah, and so I realize we have a problem in that um, we don't always have land and available facilities to grow where the enrollment growth is because we've only ever used land that we always already own. So. Yeah, we hope JFAC will help with that. That's sort of the <clears throat> task. Um, can you go to the next one, please? Uh, slide eight. Um, and is there anything from the ongoing boundary revision process that's lessons learned or anything we're learning about how to apply to this problem or these um, options, I guess? You know, actually, when we when we reviewed this information with FAC, I think what we looked at um, when we see those numbers and the number of the difference there, you know, we were comparing it to where we are this year. This year we have 900 students. Next year we're going to have 1,300 more students than our planned, you know, our, our existing capacity. And so we were using that as sort of a gauge. You know, that's why we felt when you get to that number in I think it's 2026. That is a really high level. Now, before that, you know, this is, these are numbers that we've been managing. Um, you know, we're managing 900 this year. And actually, a lot of our schools are, you know, while they have a lot of kids, it's amazing to see what they're doing um, to make things work. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and when you say um, in the bottom box of 2026, um, if estimates remain the same, we'll need another school. I, do you have a notion of whether it's like adding on or building a whole new building from scratch or even continuing use of uh, trailers, possibly more? Well, I think, you know, we, in those years before that, we see the use of relocatables. Um, that would continue. Uh, but then I think we'd be working with Mr. Chadwick. I think one of the things he is looking at is pulling some of those additions that were done in the past. And at some point, we'll get costs on those. Now, this is so far out, we're not getting those right at the moment. Um, but I think one of the lessons learned is I think they find a better cost when you build a new school versus putting on additions of, of a couple hundred seats. So we'll have to go back and look at that. And is there any idea, if we're gonna need a new school, is there any idea uh, of an option school, possibly a different option, something we don't have now, or are we trying to keep option, numbers of options, you know, the same? I think that would have to be part of the board's ongoing discussion. I think right now uh, we see uh, value in neighborhood schools, uh, and so that has been the board's priority, but I think that's open for the board to discuss about where they see that in the future. Okay. Um, I think I had one more question. While, while you're looking, Mr. Goldstein, let me go to another um, board member for oh, I got question. It. Can I? 
Okay. Thank you. Um, on slide 19, uh, I'm curious about the the plan for Buck or you know how it's fitting into our thinking. So at the bottom there, you know we're talking about instructional flex inst instructional flex space. And when you say flex, do you mean swing space, or could you tell me the difference between flex and swing? I'm going to let Dr. Murphy talk about that. Okay. I may need your help uh, with flex. I, I think both terms are sort of synonymous, okay? okay? So we can uh, utilize the facility how we best see fit. Um, you know, right now uh, the county has uh, said that we may want to be able to utilize that space. We are looking into uh, how many classrooms we could get out of that space, and we would like to then come back to the board with um, the possibility of some reconfiguration. Don't have any idea of the cost of that, but once we do, we'll bring that forward to the board and continue to work with the county. Well, the basis of my question is that um, both flex and swing say to me some kind of temporary use rather than a permanent school use there. Um, so is that the case? You know, a swing space in the past had been a school under renovation moves, you know, we'd always used Wilson, yeah. moves to Wilson for a year, then comes back, you know, to its uh, regular location. Yeah. So is that kind of temporary use at Buck the kind of thing that's envisioned or um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe simplify it even easier than this. We need seats. We're going to take anything and every, all comers that come to the plate. However we deploy our programs to fit the needs of our community is really what where we are. You can call it flex, you can call it swing, you can call it permanent. We have a seat deficit. We're going to have to think how we can utilize the space the best we can to meet the needs of our kids. At the end of the day, that's what we need to do. So we could put programs there. We've talked about possibly placing programs there or putting them in other spaces like that. So I think, um, I'm not sure uh, the, the terminology here, but I think what we're saying is we want to be open-minded to use the space in the best way that we possibly can. Okay. Ms. Talento has a comment on that. Um, Dr. Murphy, could you clarify? My recollection is, is that the county has said we we may be able to use that as temporarily. They have not committed to providing that space on a permanent basis. That's correct. Okay, so I just would encourage us to consider that as we move towards our CIP as to how we develop that space. I just wanted to confirm. Oh, my absolutely, and thank you for clarifying. I think thank that's you. helpful. Thank you. I won't get a phone call in the morning from the county manager. Uh, I, I would just who, add who is on watching that. For we're sure. getting yeah. a cost. <laughs> we're getting a cost on that, and all of this comes out of the same, you know, wallet. So whatever money we go, it, it takes away from another project. So we'll have to look at all of those when we come back with the costs. Definitely. Ms. Van Dorn. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I want to uh, follow up on a lot of the comments that Mr. Goldstein made regarding framework. Um, and I, I don't need you to flip around the slides, but there were just some quotes on slide seven and eight. You said we have to uh, build a new school at that point. And I'm just going to use that as a jumping pad to say I, I'd like us to think flexibly uh, about seats because when you're at the middle, at the elementary school level, and you need X number of seats, there's a difference between presuming you have to build a school, considering additions, or changing class size. There are a lot of tools on the table. So we say a school, but what you really mean 725 seats, right? I, I would urge us. I, I what I have heard in this conversation is to maintain our flexibility so that we can consider how to get the seats rather than presuming we have to build something. And that leads me to our, um, my second point is that in previous um, CIP discussions, the framework has included a timetable and funding. And I'm really going to be, Dr. Murphy, I'm going to be looking for that as a framework. I, I, I have a difficult time considering these without funding on the table in terms of the box that we're in and the possible cost. So this is a, a, it needs that piece of it. You've got some of the, some of the timing there, but I think we need to play that out, but you need the funding piece. And I have um, sent back to you all previous frameworks that include that information. And I'd suggest we 
have that for the next time we consider it. And also in terms of a framework, I, I, I kind of want to pull back and say, what, what do we, how do we want to look at all of this? Whether it's the elementary school seats I just mentioned or the 300 middle school seats we're talking about or the high school seats. What are our overall values that we want to approach this with? And I remember going through this exercise years ago when they were developing a CIP, and I just wrote down four principles that I would value uh, because I think it's very consistent with the uh, report that we got from the FAC. And the ones that I wrote down were maximizing green space, maximizing the use of every single site, simplifying our designs to focus on cost effectiveness, and to maximize the flexible use of every site. So if we were to approach every project that we're looking at with that philosophy, which to me is then a framework, then I can look at how much money I have and what seats I have to get, and I can ask myself, do I need to look at reconfiguring the inside of a school, putting an addition on, adding a new school, considering repurposing a building, considering flexible programming or class sizes? I don't, I don't know, but I think we, there is a world of options, and I, I see what you're bringing to us, and I, I just would, it helps me to have a framework to look at them within a larger one. Like, I think this community really is concerned about green space. I think we're very concerned about using every building well because we have a finite number of them. So I just wanted to interject that for my colleagues. If we approach it with some, consider what our basic philosophy is, I think that might, might be helpful. Um, and again, I would like the timetables and the funding. And then I'd like to just go quickly to that slide where you put the two options up. It was what, uh, 19, sorry, I'm just going, because exactly. that, it's, it's, you know, if I take that lens and apply that to these, here are some of the questions that, um, you know, I raise. Um, we are building a, fle if the Ed Center would be flexible space. We have just middle school addition versus not. That leaves out a whole lot of options. To me, 300 middle school seats divided by six middle schools is 50 students a school. At one point, we were looking at renovations at the middle schools, and some of those we haven't even pursued. I know there was a potential plan at Williamsburg, and the Williamsburg staff and PTA have constantly, as the liaison side, have asked me about that. We did do some of that at Gunson. We did do some of it at Jefferson. Um, we haven't done that at the other schools. So to me, I don't want to leave that off the table because it gets back to my fundamental philosophy of maximizing every school, uh, every site. Um, and, 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 you know, the other, it, it checks all the other boxes for me. So I'm, I personally, and I'm one board member, would be looking for more than just a middle school addition or repurposing a new building. Because right now, I can't figure out how you would put a 300 seat middle school program. I, I just, and maybe I need more information about that. And I do also share the concerns that Ms. Uh, Talento raised about a two-year set of 500 students who would have to move around. I, I'm, I'm having difficulty getting my mind around that. And I'd also uh, remind you, remind us, that we received a letter uh, and a survey from the uh, Washington Lee PTA uh, that was a survey that went from the uh, elementary school age students through the middle school to the high school students that reported out what their preference was, would be if this facility were used. And I just, I really think we should listen to that because it went all the way down to the younger families whose students would potentially be here. So I, I think, and we are going to launch into the instructional focus conversation. So again, I just, I have concerns about those two just because I'm having a hard time envisioning that. Um, but I love the, the uh, flexible use of space, whichever way we go. Um, but again, I would have that, those basically basic philosophies, and I don't want to just presume at that point we have to build a new elementary school, or at that point we have to add an addition to a middle school. I would like us to look at all the schools and see are we maximizing the use. We have gotten a lot out of the optimization projects at the three high schools, and I don't want us to forget that. I, I don't know what else is on the table out there. So 
I would encourage that. And I'm going to be looking for that. Um, me, I will be looking for that um, as we as we go forward. And I know that people are, are concerned about you know the conversation about what will high school be like. But high school has already changed significantly from when from my first child who went through high school to my current child who's going through high school. And I, I do think it's hard for us p to project that forward, but I, I think it is going to happen. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I think it is going to be different. And I don't know how you deal with that, but that's just a 10 o'clock philosophical question. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let's just verify a couple of things. Um, you're coming back on April 5th for us to approve um, the CIP framework is that is that yeah. correct? Yes. And what exactly are we going to vote on or approve? Are we picking an option? What are what's what's? No, you're not picking an option. Just um, I believe what we're doing is agreeing on the timeline and sort of the priorities based on the data, but not necessarily the projects. But these are the projects that we'll bring as we begin to work through so the framework. So would we be saying things like 2022 versus 23 in our framework? We don't have to get that specific, do we? Because I, I don't think so. Okay, it's just sort of like an overall sense of where we're, what we're prioritizing. Yeah, and it might be helpful for the board to actually give Dr. Murphy direction on if there are pieces like Ms. Van Doren just talked about principles that we want to build into it, that we do that between now and the next meeting budget. So I, I think we need to think about this process a little bit. Um, I, I did want to mention in addition to um, the, our action item on April 5th, we added a new work session on April 12th. Um, to start looking at the CIP. We have CIP season that really hits harder in May, but we've added an April 12th work session as well to get started with the, um, the CIP. And um, I feel like there are a lot of ideas that we're hearing now that, um, you know, I'm not sure what this gets us to approve something, you know, this, this vague, as, as has been mentioned, um, without funding, without, you know, um, without time. knowing if there's funding, I don't know if we could even do that middle school addition. You know, to me, I, I think of us going straight to the high school piece. So, but again, and I understand we're busy with the budget. It's really hard to um, put those numbers in right now. So I think we just need to think about what, what we're gonna do next. And we don't have to decide tonight at this board table, but let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. I just wanna ask a couple of questions, then we'll go on to the next item. On the high school capacity piece, mm -hmm. um, I know when we have done those projections in the past, you sort of see the list of all of our buildings um, and the numbers of students as well as their capacity. And then, of course, you, know, you can see what our deficit is. But, um, and I just want to confirm that these numbers do or don't include some of those, it's especially the alternative programs that often look like they have uh, surplus in seats. And then that, um, you know, the bottom line, we might have, you know, we're including seats that aren't comprehensive high school seats, so it looks like we have seats that might not fit for the students. So I just want to ask about that. Are, is, are the numbers that we're looking at, I don't know which slide it is, where you're showing high school seat deficit, does it include all those, you know, I'm talking about Langston, um, community high school, et cetera. It does. It includes the high, all of the high school seats. So that is across our programs. So to me, I got to tell you, uh, well, okay, so then let me tell you um, my overall, and, and um, Ms. Van Doren alluded to it. You know, when you look at these um, overall deficits, we have, we're going to have 25, high, 25 elementary schools in a couple mm -hmm. of years, six middle schools, three comprehensive high schools. Um, there's, a, there's an amount, there's a number of relocatables we've determined we could fit on these sites. There's also a question of what's best for the school any, any particular school environment. So when I look at elementary, for example, if there's a 500 seat deficit at the elementary level with 25 um, elementary schools, that's just 20 seats right. per school. Right. That's, you know, I, that's not really going to bother me. And I, I actually like what you've done here with saying yes. some relocatables are manageable for our system. Right. We're gonna have to, you know, just a, a acknowledge that um, because they are. Um, so then to me, as I do that kind of division, especially knowing that we're counting seats in high school that aren't um, traditional high school seats. I'm not comfortable where we are in 2022. Mm -hmm. And I just want to share that um, with my colleagues. I, the idea that we can, you know, get through that year and on to 2023, um, that's, I, I feel like we need to be looking at those numbers. We need to be targeting 2022. Um, again, not a decision we're making tonight, but just want to share that thought. Um, and 
it is, it's been a long meeting, it's getting late, so if there are no other um, comments or questions on this item, I think we'll go on to the next item. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next item is the final design and construction contract award full GMP for the new middle school at Stratford. Dr. Murphy. Yes, uh, let me turn to uh, Mr. Ben Bergen and uh, Ms. Leslie Peterson to uh, present this information. Mr. Bergen has the uh, architectural and design Understood. component and Ms. Peterson has the financials. I did. Good evening, everyone. It's very, uh, <clears throat> quite a pleasure to present the final design and GMP for the Stratford, or the new middle school at Stratford. Just as a recap, in essence, this is a new neighborhood middle school providing 1,000 seats to open in 2019. A little bit on the, on the project timeline. About three years ago, we set out on the BLPC PFRC journey. Uh, there's been lots of conversations along the way, including a local historic district designation activity that's a little bit unique to this site. Um, the last time the school board acted on a design was in June of 2016, so almost uh, two years ago at this point. And then exactly one year ago this month, we had the use permit approved by the county board. So more recently, we've, uh, we've conducted a, a, a meeting with the BLPC at the end of February, and there is a, a mistake on the slide there. The, the, the date for school board action is anticipated at the next school board meeting, so that would be April and we'll be starting construction directly thereafter. So just very briefly on the, on the aspects of the design, this is actually an identical slide that was shown during the, the county board use permit hearing. So uh, nothing has uh, substantively changed since then. Um, we, we have a, a number of improvements off-site to basically allow the, the site and the building to function uh, better as a neighborhood middle school, some improvements to help pedestrian access and vehicular access to the site. Uh, a closer look at the actual site, we, we do have a driveway connection one way going from Vacation Lane to Old Dominion. The addition is located on the, uh, the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, it's a, a three-story uh, addition, about 40 to 45,000 square feet, and we have a number of uh, site improvements and enhancements to include uh, stormwater management facilities, an expanded parking lot on Vacation Lane to replace the parking that uh, the building, the building addition will, will sit on. Moving through the, the building itself, we've made very strategic uh, renovations to the existing facility, uh, primarily to help it function better as a, as a middle school program. So uh, for those specific renovation enhancements are pointed out on, on the various slides. So in the, at the very lowest level, there is conversion of some space for a new arts and tech suite. Uh, moving up to the, the next level, you begin to see the addition, again, on the left-hand section of the, the screen. Uh, on this level in the addition, it's primarily space to enhance the uh, PE, physical education program. Um, the, the main, uh, there is a, an addition, or uh, an entrance, a component that sort of connects the addition to the existing building. Uh, also on this level, you'll notice on the far right hand of the screen, we're proposing a new elevator uh, in, the, in the building, which was a, a large ask during the, the BLPC process to help accessibility of the school. Continuing to the, the next level, in the addition, this is the, uh, um, the new library space uh, and some support classrooms surrounding it. Uh, you'll, you'll hear the term uh, heart of school used um, a couple times in the presentation. So the, it really represents kind of the convergence of the old and the new. Uh, in, in this case, it's uniting uh, the, the, uh, the areas um, where the, the addition connects the existing building, uh, where there's um, a breakout space from the library. It's very close to the cafeteria and the, and the main gym. On the upper floor, we have the, the library classrooms in the, or sorry, the science classrooms in the addition with some other support classrooms. Uh, some uh, renovations to help uh, collaboration, uh, teacher collaboration areas. And then sort of in the middle of the building where you may have been in the existing library, we're converting that to the, the work and family life suite. A couple of uh, three-dimensional 
uh, in perspective views beginning in the upper left-hand corner, you sort of see the, the site as it's arranged. And then moving to the, to the upper right-hand corner, you see some of the articulation of the facade. This as, as a historic, a local historic district, we paid particular attention to the kind of uh, facade materials that they would be complementary and very distinct from the existing building. So in that image, the, the yellow brick with the, the stone sort of on, at the base is the existing facility and then everything to the, to the, to the left, uh, including the, the green uh, pre-patinated copper cladding of the, the main material of the addition and, uh, and a, a precast sort of entry portal to mark, mark the new entrance. Just below that you see a sectional view. It's cut through the, the main entrance area. It's a three, three uh, level space in one portion, a very generous, it receives a lot of natural light just to be a very dynamic and, and welcoming space for the, for the students coming from the, the driveway connection for the, the, the parent um, drop off. And then finally on the, on the bottom left hand screen you see an interior view of the renovated arts and tech suite that's in the um, bottom level of the building. So these next several slides may sound familiar. We've, we've went through something very similar for uh, the Fleet Elementary School and the Wilson School um, in when you heard those two projects in January. Uh, so just like those, we, we are a, a CM at risk delivery method. So part one of that was to do pre-construction services that was awarded to Turner Construction Company back uh, in December of 2015. So just a couple of comments on what a GMP is. It stands for Guaranteed Maximum Price. Uh, the contractor, in this case Turner Construction, has been involved during the design process and has reviewed and given feedback to the team. They take those completed documents, they, they, they bid it, and, and then present to APS a Guaranteed Maximum Price. So that price is the price they agree to construct a project, barring any major unanticipated changes. So for this project, <clears throat> we followed a similar uh, process to, to Fleet and Wilson. And in November of 2017, the initial GMP submission very, um, uh, very largely exceeded our, our estimates by several million dollars. And so like the Wilson and Fleet projects, we pursued a number of areas to, to reduce those costs. That included extending and uh, rebidding some of the uh, elements within the project, looking at the APS owner costs, and also doing value engineering and other scope reduction options. So when we look at uh, value engineering, we're very careful to, to maintain the, uh, the essence of the project. In this case, it's uh, the capacity, sort of the, the, um, uh, the parking spaces, the, the outdoor uh, play areas. Uh, for this project, we reviewed over 160 individual items. Um, we evaluated those against several criteria, which are, are listed there on the screen. And after that evaluation, we, we started in November of 17 with uh, uh, an overage of $4.68 million. And that represented 17% of the project. It was quite a large gap for us to, to try to bridge. Through the, the uh, efforts that I mentioned on the previous slide, we were able to close that gap by a significant margin. Um, and, and by doing that, we, we accepted what we consider low to no impact value engineering items. I have a couple examples of that on the next uh, screen. In addition to that, to further look at cost savings, we did evaluate other opportunities that would uh, require significant concessions, either around the use permit approved by the county board, the uh, certificate of appropriateness, which is also approved by the county board, that, that's um, sort of the, the document that represents the historic character of the site, and or impacts on the teaching and learning program itself. So some examples of what we would consider low to no impact are, are on the screen there, and these uh, are very similar to the things that we accepted at the other projects of Wilson and Fleet. They were looking at um, simplifying designs, changing materials and finishes, uh, modifications to um, 
roofing and, and using alternative manufacturers. The kinds of things that we would, we evaluated and considered but that would impact the use permit or the COA included any kind of modification to exterior materials because those, those approvals by the county board were very specific on what we agreed to construct in the project. Uh, and that also included modifying or removing exterior canopies. Again, anything that would, would make a substantive change to the exterior of the building was, uh, would impact those two uh, approvals. Um, and, and similarly, but to a lesser degree, um, removing a portions of the planned uh, sidewalk on vacation lane. So we, we have a, listed on the screen here a number of, of items that we would consider very significant impacts to the teaching and learning environment and or uh, planned improvements to make the building more functional. Uh, these included um, um, uh, deletions to several types of renovations that we were doing in the existing building, um, removing the new elevator that was proposed to increase the accessibility of the, of the, of the gym and a few other uh, other things. The, uh, you know, I, I will say that it, value engineering on this project was extremely difficult because of all the constraints that we had. Unlike Wilson and Fleet, it's, a, it's an addition. So the changes that we make within the addition, there's, there's a, a, an economy scale that we didn't quite, we couldn't quite get to um, like we had the other projects. And there were, there were other constraints around the, the site and the and the other approvals that made, made it very difficult to, to review those, those items. So with all that uh, considered, you know, it is our staff recommendation to accept the low to no impact um, value engineering options and, and avoid any other impacts beyond that. So avoid the impacts to the COA, the use permit, um, and, and certainly the impacts to the teaching and learning environment and to, to use additional funding from the capital reserve to make up the, the remaining gap. And now I'll turn it to Ms. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Bergen. What did I do? There we go. One of the things that we um, can take advantage of on this project and that we are exploring is the Virginia Historic Tax Credit. And this is a result of the historic designation of the Stratford building. Basically what this program allows us to do is, um, it, this program was designed to incentivize the rehabilitation of historic structures. And what it allows us to do is to take advantage of some tax credits. And while APS cannot itself take advantage of the tax credits, we can find a third party who would want these tax credits and sell them to them basically. Um, it is something that it is a long process that we have to go through. Um, we we see that there's the possibility of um, getting reimbursed for between one and a half and two million dollars in costs on this project, but that would not occur until after the completion of the Stratford project because once we go through all of the approvals, then they also have to do a final audit of all the expenditures and determine whether or not they're allowable, and then reimburse us for that. Um, if we are to go through this process and if we are approved and we do actually re get some reimbursement from this, this program, um, we would recommend that those funds be then used to replenish the capital reserve um, for the funds that were taken. The proposed project funding is shown here at schematic design. Uh, the total project was $36,550,000. Um, it was composed of major construction bonds, capital reserve funds of $250,000, um, some operating funds for things like furniture and equipment that can't be bought with bonds, bonds in the amount of $800,000. And then some jointly funded items, uh, both from the county and the schools, um, totaling $4.22 million. Um, at, this, at this time, we're proposing funding of um, $39,150,000. The major construction bonds remain the same. We are proposing an additional $2.2 .2 million to be taken from the capital reserve. The operating funds stay the same. 
And then the jointly funded items um, also have increased just slightly, and uh, we propose funding that also with capital reserve. The proposed project budget, a total of $39,150,000, um, comprises a GMP of just over $30 million and owner soft costs of $8.7 million. The chart on the right outlines the proposed jointly funded items between the county and the schools. The county and schools have agreed to these items, so the county will, in fact, provide their 50% share of those items. Um, and they are all related to transportation, access, utilities, safety, and community use. So in sim summary, just to wrap up, we, we do approve, uh, recommend that the, the board approves the final design as identified in the exhibits. Uh, those are A through F. That the board approves the total project bu budget, funding available, and jointly funded items that Ms. Peterson just described, shown in exhibits uh, G and H. And the last, uh, but certainly not least, award the phase two construction phase services contract to Turner in the amount shown, just over $30 million. All right, thank you. Ms. Elliott, do we have speakers? We have one speaker, Michael Beer. Good evening, board. Um, I ask that the uh, project be supported, but that you not approve the enlarged parking lot that takes up the very valuable green space. I'd like to hear why the Episcopal Church lot next door uh, could not have been used that would have been good for the environment and saved field space, which is so valuable here uh, in this project. Um, so that's the major comment I have tonight. Um, this has not been the finest hour for the school board in terms of our sites. This is the, the, the very, very worst um, addition that the BLPC recommended uh, 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 in July a few years ago, saying this is the, absolutely the worst option that you could possibly choose, and you rolled over and chose the very worst option. So listen to your BLPC in the future. Um, just another couple other comments, because uh, I didn't want to get up three times today. On the CIP, you've got uh, $21 million in one-time funds that you're using to uh, balance your budget, and that means $21 million that potentially couldn't be used for capital reserves. So um, yeah, I know you have a lot of people asking for uh, uh, more spending, and uh, all I can say is that we're using a heck of a lot of one-time funds uh, to balance a budget here, and it's really making your life more miserable in the CIP. Um, I support uh, the superintendent's, uh, most of his budget cuts, particularly the big t ticket items. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Okay, board colleagues, questions or comments? Ms. Van Doren. Uh, I just would, as I'm the liaison to the Stratford project, and I've um, attended the uh, the BLPC meetings, and um, I wanted to just read, Susan Cunningham, who is the chair, wrote a letter of support for the request that's coming in, and I'm just gonna read the last paragraph. Proceeding with the proposed guaranteed maximum price is the best combination of managing costs, meeting modern safety and accessibility codes, and honoring our commitment to build once at this site. We look forward to your prompt review and approval followed by construction start in early April and welcoming students to the long-awaited new neighborhood middle school by September 2019. So I've watched this process. I think the BLPC worked well together. Um, everything seemed to go very well. Unfortunately, we have higher costs than we anticipated, but it sounds like the, the group supports the recommendation. That's. Susan's comments, I want to turn to my comments now. I've been very impressed with this design. I think it works really well. This community very much supported adding a middle school here and middle school seats here. I think it's very attractive. Um, and I think further up in, in Ms. Cunningham's letter, she said one of the goals was to you know build once and do this once here. It's not a place we're gonna come back to. Um, and I think it was done really, really well. So I've, I've fully support this and think you've done a, a great job given 
all the constraints, and we are going to have a fabulous historic representation of one of um, Arlington's shiny moments at this facility. So thank you for working so hard on that. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Lanto. Um, can you confirm that on slide 21, the grand total that you're asking for us to approve from capital reserves is 2.6 million? Um, actually, the total that it, we're asking for capital reserves is the additional $2.2 million uh, for front on the upper part of the slide. Okay. But the APS funding for the jointly funded items also comes from the capital right. reserve. That was the plan all along. So you would also be um, authorizing $2.31 million to be pulled from the capital reserve for the jointly funded items. So what is the total number that we're It would be $4.51 million. 4.51, okay. Of which 2.11 was anticipated. Okay, but we, so, so have we already approved the first, have we already, right, so that's, so we're not voting on that, that's already been approved? That's what I need to understand, what am I, what are we I also voting? wanted to clarify that in, in our budget that shows the reserves that we have allocated the joint fund part is included already. No, that has not been no. included already because you have not voted on this yet. So, Why? the Strat so this this allocation for Stratford has not yet been approved. Okay, both parts. Correct. Okay, that's but what we were trying to. But in the CIP to. that was approved two years ago, there was um, line items for the jointly funded items and the capital reserve item of $250,000. So those were already anticipated to be taken from the capital reserve. So I think my que then the question I'm asking is, what is the overage, the un unanticipated cost that is going to be pulled from the The unanticipated cost is $2.2 million on the upper part of the slide and $200,000 for the jointly funded 2.4 million total. Is the unanticipated, unanticipated cost. cost. Okay. Yes. Thank that you. is not equal to what's being pulled from Correct. the capital reserve. Correct. Bill. Okay. Okay. Yes. yes. But uh, I'm just clarifying because of all the projects that we have ongoing and the escalated costs, it's important for the I think the community and for, for me to understand what the overage actually is. Everything else has been allocated and planned for yes. in our CIP. Yes. We're approving four point six million, but the escalation is really only 2.4 million. Correct. Okay, but we have to vote for all of it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Goldstein. No. Thank you. That, that clarification. Um, uh, my question is about the Virginia Historic Tax Credits. And um, this is a competitive award, isn't it? In other words, there would be other jurisdictions there's an application to, program for it. I but, don't believe it's competitive in the same in the sense that there would be others trying to get our historic tax credits. So we apply and we get it. We apply and there's a pro, an approval process that they have to go through. That we have to go through. It's a three-step process, but it relates strictly to our project, not that, that we've jumped through all the right hoops and correct. things like that. So there aren't um, multiple counties, jurisdictions, whatever, try all trying to get the same limited bucket of funds. I do not believe so, but we can get back to you on that. Oh yeah, yeah, that was my understanding that these are all competitive and there's some kind of ranking process in different um, counties applications, school systems applications, and that you know we could end up at the top or we could not. So yeah, I'd appreciate that, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And again, we will be going to um, action on April 5th. Yes. Appreciate it very much. Are you going to stay with us, Mr. Bergen, for the next item? or? I get a break, but then I'll be back later. Okay. We'll see you very soon, I think. I, I think I know why. Um, the next item is the open air market at Barrett. Dr. Murphy. Mr. Chadwick, I'll turn to you for this item. It's, uh, I believe, very brief. Well, for a good evening, everybody. Um, for a little light relief, we're going to talk about an open-air market at Barrett. 
Uh, we were approached by Field to Table to use a portion of the parking lot there as a, for an open air market to be held on Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 12 noon on a, in April through November. Um, there would be a nominal annual fee of $200. Um, there are various hold harmless and insurance requirements that we're complying with. Um, they will clean up the premises under the license agreement and we may cancel at any time, 45 days notice. It's been reviewed by legal counsel. Um, the hatched area on the parking lot is where it will actually be held. And the superintendent recommends that the school board authorize the chair to execute the proposed license agreement. Excellent. Are there any speakers, Ms. Elliott? Okay, board colleagues, questions or comments about the farmer's market? It's just a quick question. I know there was an issue about restrooms. What happened with that? Uh, we found a good location to put in a uh, portable restroom that will remain during the, the uh, season of the uh, market. That, that will be locked when not in use, correct? Absolutely, yes, Great. padlocked. Okay, thank you. Mr. Goldstein. Yeah, and what is the, what's the season? Of the market, it's um, April. I go back. It oh. is up there. It's April through November. I'm not sure the exact date when it starts, and clearly it won't start this April. Is there a um, a set of criteria that you used to determine that this group and this site would be, you know, allowable or approved or something for this? And where I'm going with this is, you know, what happens when the next group says, well, you know, we want one over here, but for some reason I, that I can't think of right now, that site would not be usable or compatible with a farmer's market or something like that. I mean, are, are there a set of criteria that we can point to and say? I wouldn't say there are exact criteria because um, Arlington, in Arlington, everything is different from one place to another. But what I will say is Field to Table is the uh, operator who operates the market at um, Westover outside the library on APS property and has done so for some years um, with no uh, issues that we are aware of. No, 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 I'm not talking about operational issues. I'm talking about how do we do this equitably in the future when well, we, somebody we're comes and says by, we want to be in this spot. Right. If we're approached by other operators at other schools, we'll be happy to talk to them and bring it to you for your consideration. Thank you. Right. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have a bit of bad news for those who are, th thank you Mr. Oh, Chadwick. And um, we are gonna go on to the next item, however, we do have to take a short break for the, the our, our TV guys to change the um, videotape. We will just wait and start the minute they tell us we're ready. Okay, and we've really done
We're going to start right up. We have one more information item, and it is the concept design for the new elementary school at Reed. Mr. Bergen, I'm going to invite you to just begin. Very good. Okay, so uh, good evening again. It's, it's my pleasure to share with you the uh, proposed concept design for the new elementary school at the Reed site. So similar to, uh, I'll start this one out similar to I did Stratford. The, in essence, this is a, a new neighborhood elementary school designed to, to have at least 725 students to open and start a school 2021. At the outset, we had designated a maximum project cost of 49 million. Um, this is sort of what we envision the, the timeline uh, to look like moving through the, the design and construction process. Uh, earlier this evening, Dr. Murphy mentioned a five-year sort of planning and uh, designing, constructing cycle. We started this one with about four years to go. We began back in, uh, in last October with a joint county board, school board uh, session. Uh, we're, we're at the concept design, school board approval anticipated in April. We had originally thought that that would be March, so our schedule has slipped a little bit, but we do intend to absorb that through the remainder of the project schedule. Uh, and really, this is the first time that you're seeing the, the concept design. You'll, you'll see it again at, at schematic, and, and then just like we did for Stratford this evening, you'll see it for, for final approval and uh, uh, construction contract award. This is what the, the meeting schedule has looked like since we began the BLPC PFRC process. We started back in October. Uh, all of the meetings have been joint meetings. Uh, I think that's a, sort of a lesson learned from the fleet process, that it was, it was better to have the committees in the room to hear each other, hear all the, the voices and perspectives in the same place. Uh, we've, we've had a number of other uh, types of meetings, including a site tour in December, a community forum in uh, January. Uh, at, at the end of January, we sort of took a, uh, a consensus um, poll and ranking exercise around the six design options that were developed. We had a break there where we kept going on the transportation uh, study components. We had a session um, in, on the 21st of February. We intended to have one last night. It did not occur. It's rescheduled for uh, two, uh, two weeks for, on the April the 4th. Um, and then we introduced a meeting last week with the BLPC and the PFRC to review uh, the cost estimates. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more um, uh, when I get to that section of the presentation. You'll see a few uh, TBDs looking out into the future for the schematic phase. Uh, really, we, we sort of need um, the concept approval, and, and since we slipped a little bit on that, we haven't set the meeting dates for that. We're sort of in the process of, of arranging those uh, uh, currently. A, a couple of thoughts on um, what happens during the design process. It's, it's a very iterative process, and so uh, we thought it important to distinguish between the, thing, the types of things that happen at concept design and the things that happen at schematic design. So the big decision around the concept is where the building is going to go. Uh, that's really the, the most important decision that, that we uh, could hope to come from out of the, the concept approval. Uh, so it's building location, general building massing, and, and how much we want to reuse the existing facility. There's um, an existing building on the site. And then looking forward into uh, schematic design is where we get much more uh, detail. We'll work to resolve, refine, and complete the educational specifications. That's the list of spaces and everything that goes into the building. Uh, we'll get much more uh, detail on what the building actually looks like, you know, materials, articulation of the exterior elevations, and we'll dive much further into the vehicular access and, and on-site on parking. So I showed a very similar slide to this when we had the joint uh, county board, school board work session. You may or may not remember. There's, there's an 84-inch uh, storm sewer that essentially splits the site in two. And in October, I shared that that would be a major development constraint on the site, and that has proven, certainly proven the case. Um, on, on the site, you'll see uh, a dash line that represents the APS property. Most of the, the site is, is, is owned by APS. There's a corner at um, 
Lexington in 18th that's owned by Arlington County. Um, on the APS section of the site, there is the existing library branch, Arlington County Library, and then currently the children's school and integration station are in the, uh, the other half uh, of the building. There's a couple of um, uh, on-site parking areas, one sort of behind the library off the, the neighborhood street, and then one a little um, uh, closer off of McKinley and, and 18th. There are several uh, fields, and um, it, it's a very well-loved and appreciated site. There's a lot of activities going on. Uh, sure enough, there were people out there on the sledding hill yesterday. I've seen photo evidence of that. Um, and there's a number of other uh, types of fields. There's some courts, there's open play fields, uh, there are uh, um, playgrounds. Uh, so it's an incredibly active site located near a lot of uh, commercial and retail areas at the, at the Westover neighborhood. Uh, some of the, the questions that we had to answer early, early on during the concept process is, can we build on top of the existing facility and is it a good idea? Uh, and we spent lots of conversations within the BLPC, PFRC, reviewing those two questions. And, and the results of it were, yes, we can, in fact, build another level, a second level, on the existing uh, single level portion. It's sort of the D-shaped area on the bottom plan. Uh, there are certainly some things that we needed to take into consideration when, when doing that. Uh, and those are sort of in different buckets uh, identified there on the, on the screen. So from a teaching and learning environment, uh, the, the existing spaces with the curved corridor and the way the classrooms are laid out are very effective for a pre-K and K environment. They're less effective when you go up into the older, the older grades. Uh, so that's something that needed to be uh, considered. The, um, not to be too technical, but we sort of went, uh, when the existing facility was built, it, it kind of went halfway to accepting another floor. Uh, the, the structure is, is capable of receiving that additional floor. The type of roof that was installed had, has to be removed and sort of uh, enhanced in order to build up on top of the, the building. And even when we would add the second floor to the building, we would still need a a substantial amount of new square footage in the neighborhood of six, over 60,000 square foot just to meet the needs of the new program. A few images from our design process. We've, we had a lot of activities that looked at, uh, it, that helped draw out from the committees what they felt was most important at the site. Uh, we also had design workshops that were um, designed to, to kind of um, foster empathy around the constraints of the site and the, the limitations and possibilities of, of where we could, we could build. And the results of that were uh, six different design options that came out of that, of that process. In speaking to the, the cost component, we had developed and shared some preliminary estimates with the committees uh, along the way to help, primarily to help them provide comments and meet the charge that the school board had provided to uh, identify options of varying levels of cost. So at the, just like we do on every other capital project, once we're completed with the, the design efforts of the phase, we go into sort of a focused estimating uh, activity. And the, the results of that estimating activity came back to us and they showed that all six of the options we uh, had um, originally estimated had, had increased. Um, there were a few um, uh, important distinctions to make. So the early estimates were prepared by the architecture and engineering team. It was before the school board had acted to award the contract to the construction manager at risk. Um, and, and once that award was made, the, the CMR could undertake its estimating activities. And, and we received updated estimates. We sort of locked ourselves in a room for the better part of a day to reconcile between the two groups. And then we had finished our reconciled estimates. So those, that's the material that we shared with the BLPC and the PFRC last week to get their, to get their options. Um, 
through that conversation, and certainly the correspondence that followed up from the meeting, there's, there's still a very um, overwhelming preference for the scheme that we're calling the integrated scheme above any other option. And the final reconciled total project cost estimate for that option is just over 55 million. It's at 55.1. And so just speaking a little specifically about that particular design option, uh, the, the blue shape on the screen is the new elementary school. In essence, what this option looks at is to uh, contain all the development on the site to the one side of that 84-inch pipe running down the middle of the site. So what that involves, it involves a removal of a significant portion of the existing building and constructing three to four levels of space in that area. The benefits of this option is that it preserves the, the greatest amount of open space. Um, and it provides sort of a consolidated school facility. Uh, some of the options looked at distributing the uh, elementary program between two buildings. Uh, some of them looked at uh, similar two buildings, but maybe a, a physical connection that bridged over, uh, an aerial bridge over that um, utility pipe. And this is Ms. Peterson. <laughs> so the project funding for the Reed School, um, originally in the CIP was $49 million, um, $38.25 million in bonds, $4 million from the Capital Reserve, $1.25 in operating, and then some jointly funded items totaling about $5.5 million. <clears throat> now at Concept Design, um, all of the estimates that we have um, show that the project uh, is coming in around $55 million, which would require an additional $6 million for this project. Um, we're still working through this process. We don't have a specific source of funding yet determined for that $6 million. Um, as we proceed through the CIP process, uh, the board can evaluate um, available options for funding the, this $6 million. Um, in addition, I believe uh, the part of the charge to the staff and to the BLPC will be to try to ensure that the project doesn't come in at $55 million, that it comes in at something less than that. Uh, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is the green shaded major construction bonds figure because in the CIP, and I'm going to show you that next. Oh, you can't see that very well. <clears throat> well, I can't see that very well. You might be able to see it perfectly. Um, the Reed project um, is not scheduled to be brought to the voters for authorization until November of 2018. It's scheduled to be on the referendum this coming fall. So at this point, we have the funding in order to continue through the design process, but before any construction can begin, um, we will need to go to the voters and tell them how much this project is estimated to cost and put it on the referenda for them to vote on. So there will be a definitive point at which um, a decision will have to be made. And so to, in summary, the recommendations are to uh, approve the integrated concept design, including the uh, general building location, massing, and extent of, of reuse renovation of the existing building. To approve a maximum total project funding of $55 million. Uh, reaffirm the criteria that I first mentioned, uh, that it would be a new neighborhood middle school for at least 725 seats to open elementary, elementary school. school. Thank you. Um, I heard that. At least, uh, at least folks are awake. Yes, thank you. Uh, a minimum of 725 seats and uh, for completion in 2021. Uh, and then lastly, to direct staff to proceed to the schematic design phase, and as Ms. Peterson mentioned, uh, charge the staff and the BLPC members to look for ways to reduce uh, project costs to get it closer to the $49 million available, uh, as close to that as, as possible. And that is all we have for you this evening.
Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Elliott, I believe we have speakers. Yes, we have seven speakers. They didn't really just come to watch us. Um, you can ask. And I believe we're going to start with our BLPC and or PFRC chairs. Yes, we have. Our BLPC chair is unable. PFRC chairs first. Yeah. Yeah. We, the BLPC chair is not here. Is that correct? He, he is not able to make it. Hans Bauman is, yeah. Yeah, he is going to come when we take action. Right. So PFRC, Mr. Schroll. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cannon, members of the board, Dr. Murphy, uh, for the record, my name is James Schroll and I am the chair of the Public Facilities Review Committee. Um, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight about PFRC's consideration of the concept design for Reed School. Um, as Mr. Bergen noted, PFRC and BLPC held nine joint meetings to consider uh, the concept design for the new elementary school uh, and considered six design concepts over seven months. Um, I wanna thank the BLPC and PFRC members who are here uh, tonight and stick, sticking with us. I'm sure you'll hear from them um, soon. They spent many, uh, many days and hours with us considering uh, these options. I wanna thank them for, for their work. I also wanna thank um, Member O'Grady for, for her uh, liaison uh, efforts to the process. I know she'll be speaking about that uh, shortly. Um, the PFRC, PFRC strongly supports the staff recommendation for the integrated concept and encourages the school board uh, to vote to adopt it at their, their April meeting. Uh, the PFRC believes that this is the best concept for the site. It concentrates the density toward Washington Boulevard, builds up, not out, um, as was outlined in the public uh, facilities plan, um, preserving the <coughs> contiguous open space and trees on the site. Uh, it meets the principle of civic design principle to optimize open space for public relaxation and recreation and minimize building footprint. Uh, the PRFRC members noted um, that the other concepts before us at last week's meeting um, didn't account for that loss of open space. And while it's not necessarily on the school's balance sheet, it's kind of on our wider county balance sheet when we lose open space. Um, and it comes at a cost. And while the county does have um, acquisition funds for acquiring other parcels. It's not just for open space meets. Uh, we acquired three um, homes to um, broaden the site for the new fire station eight, uh, as, we, as we all know. Um, so this design will provide the needed seats. Um, and as we've heard from the educators who participated in our process, it will all, also function well as a school. Um, I wanna speak uh, briefly about the consensus that we've had around the integrated scheme, integrated concept. Uh, the PFRC, BLPC, staff, civic associations, and nearby neighbors have all gotten around this, this concept. And I wanna note that we've heard from many folks who have participated in many processes in this county that that's a rarity. We don't see that often in our, in our public processes, uh, let alone our school, um, school projects. Um, so the PFRC acknowledges that the integrated concept is not certainly not the cheapest as Mr. Bergen just walked through, um, but we believe that it, it is the best at fulfilling the need for more seats while also respecting the county's goal, um, county goals, and also the neighborhood character. So we urge its adoption at your April 5th meeting. Um, I want to thank you again for the opportunity and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stacy Snyder. Also a committee chair. Hello, good evening again. Um, I'm Stacy Snyder, I'm the chair of the uh, uh, facil Facilities Advisory Committee, and this is my third remark of the evening. Um, as I have stated in previous remarks, the FAC advocates for a perspective that takes into consideration the needs of the entire school system and puts each decision into the context of how it impacts our seat needs as a whole at every school level and how it fits within our overall budget and bonding capacity. The pressures over our enrollment growth have put us into a position and an environment where we need to ensure that every decision is prudent with our fiscal resources, our available spaces, and use of bonding capacity. Seeing the number of additional schools we will need 
even in the best case scenario in the next decade is sobering. We urge you to consider the long-term impacts of finding the additional six million to fund the integrated option and the precedent that this sets. We urge you to ask as you consider the impacts of finding funding funds beyond the approved budget, will spending more on this project mean that less will be available to spend on other seat needs in this CIP? Will spending more on this project project add to our debt service and operating costs that are already facing cuts and shortfalls. If the county can find additional funding, is this the best use of those funds? Are there other, or are there other capital or program needs that are more pressing? Fiscal responsibility and prudent long-term planning should be primary factors in our decision-making matrix. We are no longer in an environment where it is responsible to view any decision in isolation. It is easy to think, What's a few more million dollars? But a few more million dollars is not insignificant, especially when we are looking at steep increases to our operating costs and debt service, and both APS and county are looking for ways to cut costs across the board to meet budget deficits. We understand one of the major concerns in the community with the Reed Project is the loss of field and green space. The fact shares those views and as we understand, this is a larger issue that impacts all the county, both children and adults. Given enrollment increases and funding constraints and limited availability of land, we acknowledge that it will unfortunately be the case that field and green space will inevitably, will inevitably be lost to individual projects at Reed and at other past projects and future project, projects. Therefore, the fact strongly recommends that APS and the county prioritize finding and purchasing, if necessary, new field and green space for all of the county as we are all adversely impacted by the loss of fields and green space. Finally, we are very concerned about the suggestion to make the capacity of the school smaller in order to accommodate the integrated option within cost. We think this would be an irresponsible choice for many reasons. We have a growing seat need at the elementary school level in this year's projections. Projections show that after we build in 2021, um, a 25 seat school, we will face a shortfall of elementary school seats of approximately 1,400 seats by 2027, 2028. We have another elementary school identified in the 26, uh, 2016, 2026 CIP at 725 seats location to be determined in 2025. Projections this year show that planning for this number of seats is still warranted. Building a smaller school to accommodate Community desires creates a precedent that other Arlington communities can use when we go through this process again and creates questions of equity in neighborhoods that have accepted larger schools. The FAC urges the school board to consider these points as it deliberates the options for the Reed School and that your decision is made with full transparency and within the context of the CIP. It is important that this decision is made in the context of our overall seat need how it fits in the overall budget, and how you, the school board, are balancing the constraints. More importantly, it must be clear to the community what the trade-offs are and what the impact of this decision will be to all of Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Molly Ketchum. Good evening, I'm Molly Ketchum and I'm the Reed Project BLPC and PFRC rep for Westover Civic Association. I want to thank you first for sticking with us tonight, but also for hearing our committee's strong voice and putting the integrated project back into consideration. I'm also here to strongly advocate for the integrated scheme that can accommodate 725 seats. The integrated scheme was universally voted as the best option by both committees and is the first choice for all six civic associations neighboring the Reed School. The scheme is the best for learning, is echoed by all of the teachers on those committees, has the most energy efficient design, the smallest footprint, the least amount of additional impervious surfaces, and preserves all of the existing field space and courts which are indispensable to Arlington children, sports teams, and residents. Alternatively, the other schemes have been raised as unsafe options for our children, and the teachers have weighed in quite clearly that those two designs make transition times between classrooms almost impossible for our children, given the length of time it would take to walk to get to their core classes. The community and the county embraces walkable neighborhood schools that alleviate overcrowding of the surrounding schools, while preserving the widely recognized unique character of Arlington County. 
Voting for the integrated scheme would be a rare win-win opportunity in which this entire community of six civic associations who wholeheartedly embrace the school board's decision on this scheme. Please respect the BLPC and PFRC process, the time and effort put in by the volunteers on those committees, as well as the significantly aligned community feedback and vote for the integrated option for Reed School. Thank you. Next speaker is Bill O'Brien. Hello, I, I, my name is Bill O'Brien. I don't come to you guys very often, and I've got to learn to look better at the agenda, because at 6.30 I was rushing to get here on time. So anyway, thank you for everything you do. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been following the Reed School uh, Planning Committee's meetings since last fall. I'm not on the committee. I want to thank APS and uh, the committees and the, and the school board and uh, the county board for reviving the integrated design. I strongly back it, as do all the community associations. Moving forward, I ask that you keep two things in mind, and, and they're related. The first is that I think it's really important to conduct a transportation, parking, traffic study as soon as is feasible. I think the West oversight is tight. I think it's tighter than a lot of people, constricted, than, than a lot of people seem to realize, even the transportation consultants who've been looking at it so far. Uh, getting 725 students and 100 staff on and off that site safely each day is going to be tricky without suffocating either the businesses, the neighborhood, or the green space. So it's going to take some innovation. Um, so I please address transportation thoroughly and soon. Uh, as a 33-year resident of Westover, I do have some ideas on that if you want to hear them sometime. The second point I have is that the, please know that the residents of Northwest Arlington County really uh, do value and use the green space at Reed, so please conserve as much of it as you can. Thank you for everything, and thanks for all the, you do great work. Thank you. Next we have Shana Rothman. Okay, th hello, my name is Shanna Rothman, and I live at the corner of Lexington and 18th Street, and so I really appreciate you deciding that this will be an elementary school. I was back here about nine years ago when they were moving the library down there and redesigning, and we were hoping it would be an elementary school then. And so I, key points are that the outdoor space really has great outdoor physical activities for our area. And we love that you even had on, on the presentation neighborhood, because we'd love to keep it as a neighbor, neighborhood walkable school. We. Um, like the ability to build up and like they've said four floors would be great let's do it right this time and not have to feel like we have to have re relocatables on all this valuable green space because we love our basketball courts and just the idea that we would have to be putting things on this valuable green space and finally please consider the parking lot uh, expanding from Washington Boulevard just like Bill was saying is that the ability to be able to make a turn and not have too much transportation and buses going through really tight small streets in the Westover neighborhood it would be easier if they did have the ability to go into a parking lot uh, behind the library and that would also be good for the Westover shops and the farmers market in the area Thank you so much for all your efforts, and we really appreciate this integrated design being back on the table. Thank you so much. Next, we have Vanessa Guest. Good evening. My name is Vanessa Guest, and I'm here tonight representing the six civic associations that surround the Reed property. Westover Village, Terra Leeway Heights, Highland Park, Overly Knowles, Dominion Hills, Madison Manor, and my own Leeway Overly. We are very encouraged that the school board heard the staff's recommendation this evening for the integrated option with 725 seats for the Reed School. We strongly support the recommendation, and on behalf of our residents, we really thank you for hearing our voices. Uh, we hope that tonight's recommendation serves as a capstone to the dozens of meetings, presentations, and individual discussions that we've had over the last six months. We see this progress as a testament to the value of civic engagement and the willingness of the school board, the county board, APS staff, county staff, educators, residents, and myriad stakeholders 
to work together towards the common goal of getting to what's best for our students and for the wider community. We look forward to continued collaboration as we work to achieve the affordability of this option. Thank you. Under a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Our last speaker is Robert Swenis. Good evening, Rob Swinnis. I'm also a member of the Leeway Overly area. I happen to also be the vice chair of the Neighborhood Conservation Advisory Committee, but I'm not really wearing that hat this evening. But I want to let you know that be wor as by working through the NCAC, I have for many years seen instances where you have capital projects that come in with a certain cost, or at least they're estimated as a curtain, certain cost, and about the time you're ready to actually issue a contract, you need money. And we have always found a way to find the, the delta that we're missing so that these neighborhood projects can be executed. And that brings us to the big elephant of the room. Where do we get the $6 million? And I have a suggestion to you, and it did not originate with me, but I think it's a very excellent suggestion. At the corner of Lexington and 18th Street, you have the site of the old library, which is no longer there because of an agreement between county board and the school system. But that property is administered by uh, Par Department of Parks and Recreation. I would recommend that the school board talk to the county board about a transfer of land because the school board could effectively sell that land to Arlington County in exchange for uh, park and rec bond funding, which is intended to protect recreational and open land in the county. Now the net effect of this, we'll say $6 million, if you took $6 million worth of that property, probably up around Lexington Street, certainly mostly there, and transferred that to the county in exchange for their $6 million coming in, what are you going to get? You're going to have all those fields preserved, but you're also going to have those fields preserved so that the students themselves can use them. And the county has had and the schools have had relations like this before. Look at Tuckahoe Park and Tuckahoe Elementary School. Look at WNL High School and Quincy Park. These are very common relationships you have. There's no reason why this cannot be done on this site. The speaker. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming out. Um, board colleagues, questions and comments. Questions or comments. Ms. O'Grady. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Cannon. Um, as the liaison to the uh, BLPC process. I just wanted to say first thank you to James Scholl and to Hans Bowman for leading this process. This has been a long process and one that I feel that you've led, uh, quite, both, led quite well. I want to also thank the community members who have been, participated in this process. Um, you have stuck with us through thick and thin and I'm happy that we're moving towards the end. I. Unfortunately, Hans Bowman could not be here tonight because he's traveling for work, but he did send a little message, and I'm going to follow Ms. Van Dorn's uh, lead and just read a little bit um, of an email he sent today. And he says, the BLPC appreciates the engagement of the school board as you work through a complex and challenging capital funding environment, including expansive projects at multiple sites across the country. We especially support moving the Reed project forward with the right design solution for our students in our county, despite the higher than projected cost. We would remind the board that the original $49 million target was set in the 2016 CIP two years ago before true degree of uh, DC area construction cost escalations were made clear. Approving the staff recommendation to proceed with the integrated concept this time will allow the project to remain on schedule. I just wanted to share that because I believe he would have shared that if he could have been here tonight. Um, I just want to say that if we do move forward um, with approving this design at the higher than expected cost, I think that this would be an excellent way for the county and the school boards to show financial and planning collaboration on priorities, priorities that serve all Arlingtonians uh, which include optimal learning environments and preserving green space. Um, and if we do move forward, I'd also ask the BLPC and the PFRC members to help us move forward in a way that can keep costs in containment so that as we move forward, we can keep um, other priorities um, for other future projects um, in mind and prioritized as well. Thank you. Questions? 
Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Um, so, uh, can you go to uh, slide three, please? Thanks. So, this, uh, am I in the right one? Yes, this final design, school board approval. Is this the guaranteed maximum price uh, milestone? That's correct. Okay. And so, before we get there, uh, we're here today on um, concept design, followed by schematic design, followed by uh, use permit, right, um, application, followed by construction documents, followed by um, guaranteed maximum price. You got it. Right, and they all have opportunities for the price to go up. <clears throat> Uh, at, at the conclusion of each of those stages, we do perform two independent cost estimates as check-ins. So similar to what we did during this phase, we would go through the same exercise where the architect and engineering team prepares an estimate and the construction manager at risk does the same. Um. Okay. Uh, so on slide 10, and I think this is what you were saying in the last bullet, the, uh, the reconciled total cost for the concept phase is 55.1 million. But uh, that's been an increase of 6 million from what the, the charge was, from what the cap was. And that's just at concept design phase. That, right. That's correct. So the CIP included a, a maximum project cost of 49 million. So that <coughs> cost was developed over two years ago. And at that time, we didn't have a BLPC, we didn't have a PFRC, we didn't even have a concept. It was just based around an idea around what we would expect to add to the site in terms of square footage uh, at, the, at that present time estimated construction cost. So this is the first time that we have gone through, you know, several months of, of committee and community engagement to develop and, and create very specific and detailed cost estimates to support the, uh, the, the different options explored during the phase. And it, can you go to the next one, please? I think it's, um, no, I'm sorry, it's um, 13. Okay, so this is hard to read, but um, there's three, um, years, three opportunities here for um, selling the bonds that would get us to the 49 million that's been identified in the CIP. What? Well, no, it says... Uh, we, we do a referendum every other year. We do sell bonds annually. So um, 12 and then 19.25 and then 7. Correct. But underneath the couple of lines down on the fiscal 21 in red here it shows we're going over the 10% um, whatever that's called guideline maximum debt service ratio debt service ratio limit and is that something that we can actually do or with the county's permission we can yes ha have we gotten that we did back when we did the CIP in 17, yes. Okay, so that's, that's legit. That's something we can actually do. Yes, we, in, we wouldn't have. Uh, if the this plays out. The school board would not have adopted uh, CIP with those red numbers in it had the, the county not given it their it, blessing. It was also then adopted by the county as part of its CIP. Yes, it was. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, there was another CIP-related uh, or um, bond funding-related question. And I heard that there's a restriction on um, demolition of a project that's still being paid for. Would that be the case in this integrated design? That because the bond funding that... We have um, checked with council and they did not believe that this would be an issue. Okay. So for the integrated design. Correct. That could be done without running afoul of the however, yes. whatever the, the money was. Correct. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, oh. 
Okay, so um, we've had dollar cost increases for Wilson, Stratford, and Fleet recently, just within the last month, two months, right? For Wilson and Stratford, we did, but for Fleet, we did not. Oh. Okay. Okay, it was the value engineering that did it. For yes, fleet. we had, we had okay. uh, to close the gap, but we were able to do that without uh, seeking additional funding for that okay. particular project. So, in a nutshell, I, I have no problem with the <clears throat> integrated design. I, it, it's a superior design, it checks all the boxes that we need, it's the 725 seats, it preserves green space, it was opened by 2021, all of those things that are in the charge. My problem is we don't know how we're going to pay for it. And today, we're $6 million over the cap. And as I mentioned, we're still many milestones away from the final product. Uh, so even today, we don't have a specific source of funding for that extra $6 million. Is that right? Is that what you said? We have not proposed one, no. Yeah. Um, and we are potentially looking at steel and aluminum tariffs kicking in soon, uh, right? Isn't that the, the news? And uh, I mean, I'm having trouble understanding what it is I'm supposed to approve. I, I know what the design is, but I, I'm having trouble understanding how we're gonna pay for this given the opportunities for costs to go up over the next 18 months before the, the school opens. Um, and one more question. Uh, this concept design doesn't deal with parking or transportation, right? I think there was a, a note on one of those slides about that. That so, it, it only deals with citing the location on the property. So primarily the biggest decision at concept design for this particular project is the location of the building. You know, to, to develop the cost estimates and, and what we have shared uh, with the BLPC and PFRC preliminary ideas around on-site on parking, and those are shown in the, in the, uh, the image here on the screen. It, it includes an expanded uh, lot off of McKinley 18th Street uh, and also an extension to the lot that's behind the, the current library. So while the transportation study is ongoing and it's always a, um, a constant conversation around uh, the committees about balancing different competing needs, we have uh, taken um, a preliminary estimate and we um, r related to parking quantities and that's represented on what you see on the screen here. And, and this is what is is what was formed the basis of the the cost estimate as well. Um, I guess my my basic question is. Whatever, whatever works out with the parking and the transportation, is that going to become higher cost for us? Is there a. Is there an answer we haven't gotten to yet about parking? that is going to in involve a, an additional cost to this project? So, so the, the um, trying to think of a good way to answer that. Uh, you don't have to answer it now if you need more data, that's fine. I mean, we're, we're only at the info item I stage. I think the, the, at the concept stage, um, we, we have ideas around parking and, and I think that it's, it's not abnormal at all that those conversations continue on into the next phase and then also with the, with the use permit phase because the county staff and county commissions want to weigh in on the parking solutions, the transportation solutions for the project. So each of those entities have, have their opportunity. A point of clarification, the, the project as proposed does not include any structured parking. So I think if that comes into the equation, that is something, uh, uh, certainly a cost um, uh, multiplier by, by significant factors. Uh, so I think that we, if we're in a, a similar range to what we propose here on, on the screen as far as what we provide in, in additional parking, then that is captured in the, in the project cost estimate. 
Uh, all right, so let me ask the question a different way. Um, the concept design on the $55 million suggested or um, estimated price, th does that include any parking concept? Yes, it, in it includes what, what's on the, sh on the screen here. So we have, we have expanded surface parking okay. on a uh, McKinley and 18th. Is that gonna... So where the blue cars are, yeah, there. that lot's a little larger than the existing lot. Uh, exi the existing lot is sort of single loaded. That's a double loaded with a, a little more expansion for a, a drop off. Okay. And then the, the little dog leg headed toward Washington Boulevard is, is additional spaces. Okay. No, yes. Not all of it, just, okay. a, just a yes. little, there you go. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, but like, like the rest of the aspects of the project, if there's more refinement that could be, that could change, like everything else as we go to schematic or use permit or something like that. Absolutely, I mean the site plan will, will change as we get more information, as we get further in the transportation study, it will get refined um, through the natural progression of design. And just a, a comment about the, um, the sort of additional six, six million. So what we've, what we've done in the current cost estimates is recognize the, the increase that we're seeing in the, in the industry and in the, the status now. So part of the, the overage is attributable to that. So we're, we sort of understand where costs are now and we also understand that uh, projected costs into the future are expected to escalate at a higher value. And so those estimates include that new information. And so that makes up some of the reason why the estimate is higher than, than the original 49 million. So you're looking forward also yes, with the, some kind of escalation rate. Yeah, the, the uh, concept estimate includes a, a 5% per annum escalation rate. And that's built into the 55 million? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, two uh, more. Uh, content. Okay. Uh, a yeah, comment Ms. Ms. and a question. I think Ms. Talento wanted to follow up on <coughs> something that you were asking. So let's switch to that and then. I'll be real, uh, I'll be real oh, fast. Okay. I want to thank Rob Swenis for coming up and offering an idea for where we can find the revenue. And we're definitely going to explore that. And my last question is, um, I guess for Dr. Murphy, we um, had planned on or asked for uh, low, medium, high options. Uh, from the BLPC, are we going to see that, or is that OBE? I think based on uh, what we're hearing from the community, and also, um, you know, where we are this evening, uh, we wanted to bring this forward uh, as the best representation of all the work that's been done. If you'd like to see those, uh, we can bring those back. Um, but I think getting gaining a sense of where we are this evening and a sense of the community, we thought it would be uh, most effective to bring forward the integrated design and continue to move forward. Okay, so it's the low, medium, and high is pretty much OBE, and given all the rest of the reality, it's about where we are. I, I, I would say, but that information is out there, and it's been shared with the committee, and you know, all the six of those options uh, are evident to uh, you know, the folks that were part of those uh, groups. And Mr. Goldstein, we could provide board direction if we wanted to see additional um, designs, and we could we could discuss that. But as of now, we have not provided that direction um, in terms of bringing this forward for tonight. Oh, uh, right, understood. We could always do that. I was just wondering if it was the the plan that they continue on with the low, medium, and high uh, recommendation. I would say at this point only if we provide that direction. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Talento. I, I did want to follow up on some of Mr. Goldstein's comments. Uh, on the most recent, we did we were provided um, six options that did have low, medium, and high costs, preliminarily to this recommendation. Just so the community knows, we did see that, um, and a lot of the comments that are made today hindered a lot of that process, and we had to uh, really consider, I think, um, the value of the integrated pro project versus uh, the things that the other projects could could compromise, um, but this is just a recommendation. There's no 
vote, I'm just saying for discussion purposes. The other piece on the parking, when I was looking at those designs provided, um, I did see space, a uh, number of spaces, and I understand that per number of seats, we are required to provide a number of parking spaces. Um, in this design, we have accounted for that. Is that correct? So the, the zoning uh, ordinance actually requires um, APS to do, as you, as you say, calculate the required numbers of on-site spaces uh, based on factors of st number of students. So we have X number of spaces for staff and then Y number of spaces for visitors. The, the ordinance also allows uh, schools to request um, a modification to that requirement. And, and in the last, I think, five or six projects, we have pursued a modification to, um, to the zoning ordinance. So instead of meeting the prescriptive uh, nature of the, the code, we do a needs-based analysis and review, uh, because we know it's, it's, it has to be a balance between different constraints, and open space uh, is definitely one of them. Okay. So did, are we going to need to re request a modification if the schematic design stays as is with the parking that we have allotted for at this time? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you anticipate us having any issues getting approval for that modification? Uh, you can say I don't know. I was just trying to understand I compared I to historically the other modifications we've saw. Yes, I, c I could just share what, what we've experienced in the past. I mean, and each of the time that we have saw a modification, we, re we received it, okay. I think, in the last five or six capital projects. Okay. And, and again, this, um, this is sort of the first step in a very long process. Yes. You know, we, we do have several more meetings with the committees during schematic. Uh, and as I mentioned, the county commissions also, particularly the Transportation Commission, Planning Commission, also value the opportunity to comment on, on what we propose at the site plan. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Peterson, the next question is for you. You said at one point during the presentation that we will have to make a decision, and you mentioned that we have not asked the voters for f bond funding for this particular project. So my question is, is, is one of the decisions that we'll have to make a consideration of asking for more um, funding from the voters, depending on how it plays out with our debt capacity ratio? Uh, is that when you said we have to make decisions, I'm trying to understand, do those decisions come into play as what we're using from capital reserve, what we're going to ask the voters, whether that increases, um, what we can work out with the county, if anything, all of those are the decisions that we'll have to make. Were you referring to, or did you have something more specific in mind? Um, I, all of those and all of the other decisions that are going to be part of your CIP process um, from, from now until June, because any bond referendum items that are proposed have to fit within that debt service ratio, that our debt capacity. So um, regardless of what happens, this will need to go to the voters in November. And we sell bonds annually and we generally get bond premiums, uh, or we have in the last few years. We have in the past few years. And that um, income can only be used for capital Correct. Uh, projects. And our capital reserves, the majority of income money that we have in there can only be used for capital projects. Correct. Okay. So I just wanted to understand how that gets refilled over time and how it's allotted specifically for capital projects and that it can't be used for other funding needs in our operating budget. Is we, that correct? We have we have funded the capital reserve with with both the bond premium and uh, funding from closeout over the years. Okay. So there it is a combination, but we have been using um, those funds. So what, what's left is, is primarily what we, the lightest thing that we put in, which is mostly bond premium. And my understanding is that this was established in 2010 because our board at that time foresaw that we were going to have a lot of capital needs in the years to come so yes, that we would have money to supplement our projects as, they, as we built to yes. accommodate the growth. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ms. Van Doren. Yes, I'll just, I'll be short. First of all, I think it's a great project. I think it's, it's been wonderful to see the community come together and support this. Um, so thank you. Thank everybody for doing that. It's, uh, it's great. I'm supportive of this. I know that it makes us nervous uh, to go over budget, but uh, I think you, when you start a job, you finish it, and uh, this is supported. And I think that we are very much in the, in the time period in which we're going to be fitting buildings into neighborhoods um, in perhaps not standard ways, and this fits 
the neighborhood. So I'm very supportive of it. I'm supportive of the additional funds. However, I, I would like us to consider when we approach this, uh, charging the BLPC with trying very hard to bring this project as close to the on target amount of money, but definitely within. We already did that. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry, it's, it's there. So I would, I would like us, um, I'd like us to do that because I know that as you go through schematic, there might be opportunities to find ways that we could reduce the cost. But um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for this um, project. I'm excited about it. Excellent. And um, thank yous have been extended a number of times. Mr. Goldstein, you had a follow up? Yeah, I just want to follow up on that. The, in the charge to the BLPC, we call out a maximum total project cost of $49 million, no less than six times in here. No more than $49 million, no more than $49 million, maximum of $49 million. So we use that language already. I'm not blaming anybody. I know that there's cost increases, materials, labor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but, but putting in language on a piece of paper does not hold cost down as much as we want it to. So changing that number to 55 is number on a paper. And this is where my heartburn is coming from because I don't know what this project is gonna cost. And before I say to the people who are providing this money, the, the, the taxpayers and the voters, yes, this is the right thing for us to invest in, I gotta have a good idea what this is gonna cost. And I don't have a good idea right now. Did y'all want to respond to that? Okay. Yeah, uh, I will say that, um, well, actually, let me just go to my comments, which, which might address your, your uh, a comment a little bit, Mr. Goldstein. So first, a number of thank yous have already been extended. Ms. O'Grady um, you know, did many of them. Mr. Schroll, thank you very much. And thank you to all the members of the BLPC and PFRC who are here and community members. We did get the email from the joint, all the, the groups of civic associations today. And that was um, nice to see. So thank you all for your advocacy, Mr. Bergen, of course, Mr. Chadwick, Ms. Peterson, um, you know, for all your, all your hard work on this. Um, but I do, I, I want to thank very much uh, my colleagues um, this, we have had many, many intense conversations in the last, what, week? Mm -hmm. Week, 10 days, maybe just a week, um, to get this, to come together on this, to, to bring this forward. And um, it takes, you know, people have asked all these questions, um, thought through the different ways that we could pull this off, um, asked each other whether we'll be able to pull it off, challenged each other on this, and, um, I think that it's, this board is very committed to moving forward on this, and, but it's, it's been a lot of work, and I really wanna thank you all, because it's, it's really, it took a lot of, um, a lot of energy. So um, I also wanna thank the county board, because they um, unanimously expressed support for this project. It's not their decision about which project we go to, but they were very supportive, um, to the point where some of them were trying to figure out if they could, find some money for us and, and maybe the selling the land is, is, is an idea we could bring to them. Um, we have not asked them for that at this point um, because we know we are going into our CIP season where we're gonna be looking at uh, a very challenging set of things we wanna do and so we'd like to talk to them about whether they can help be supportive of our full CIP. So that's why we didn't actually go directly to asking them to help fund this project, but we will. That's going to happen. We're going we're gonna to make that ask. But I, I, I really do appreciate their interest in this project. And they, um, they were, were very clear that, that they felt that this, this was the superior project. So I want to thank everyone um, for their hard work on this. Um, uh, as part of that, and, and to get to Mr. Goldstein's point, we did look back at our previous projects, our current projects, which are Stratford, Wilson, Fleet. And um, for what it's worth, um, in every one of those at concept, the cost of those projects did go up um, pretty significantly in some cases. However, between concept and schematic, they did not. They stayed the same. There's one exception where we added a historic piece to Stratford, which was almost a separate. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm sure that that's 
that's going to be the next step here that we can we can continue that trend and again maybe even find ways um, to bring it down a little bit we, we certainly would would hope for that um, one of the speakers uh, use the phrase achieve the affordability of this option and I just think that's a great uh, motto achieve the affordability so that's I think what we would like to charge you with so with that um, board colleagues shall we move on to the th thank you very much for your hard work thank you all for coming out so sorry it has gone as late as it has um, we don't do this very often quite this late um, but thank you very much and um, with that we are on to new business and um, so Board colleagues, uh, with apologies, we do have an item of new business. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> There's Dr. Natris. Um, the item is the ESSA Title IV A application. Dr. Murphy. Yes, thank you. Um, we've shared some information with the board about uh, this particular item in the sense that uh, we would like to bring it forward this evening. And if you uh, feel confident enough to be able to vote on it, we would like to proceed in that way. Uh, this is a grant opportunity that um, the Virginia Department of Education has encouraged us to pursue. And the reason we're bringing it forward in this matter is because we are on a shortened timeline. So Dr. Natras, with that as a little bit of background and really the opportunity for some resources that we could use in some of our summer programs, could you talk a little bit more about it? Yes, so federal programs at 1139 at night. Um, fortunately, I think this is um, a fairly simple element of some of the federal programs pieces. So I want to thank you for allowing us to bring this forward as new business. And I do want to take this opportunity to introduce Kate Coburn, who some of you may have met. She has stuck with us this evening. I said, eh, sometime between 8.30 and 10. <laughs> off, right? Just a little bit on this one. Um, but um, Kate is here with us, so I want to take a minute to introduce her. She'll give you a brief um, overview of what it is we're asking for, and then hopefully we can um, go ahead and vote on that this evening. So I'll turn it over to Kate. Thank you, Dr. Natris, for the kind introduction. Thank you, board members, for the opportunity to speak to you. I recognize that I am the last thing standing between, literally, the last person standing between <laughs> you and your families tonight, possibly between you and your bed at this point. I will uh, keep it brief. Uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, uh, authorized a funding stream under Title IV Part A, uh, which is known as the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant. Congress did include the funding for the grant in its budget, and VDOE notified Arlington earlier this school year of an allocation of about $72,000 for the current school year, for 2017-2018. That notification did come in this initial year significantly later than the typical cycle of communication, and at that time, it was determined that um, planning and implementing a Title IV-A program as prescribed, encompassing all of the associated criteria uh, with the timing and funding that were available for 2017-2018 would present APS with a number of challenges. However, since coming into this role, uh, I have been working with VDOE to explore the possibility of transferability of the 27-2018 funds uh, allocated under Title IV Part A to Title I to support programs and activities that were already planned for this school year in Title I and that would likely have been impacted by a separate reduction in allocation that we received in those grants after the start of the school year. So. Um, uh, the VDOE has approved our request for transferability um, to utilize these funds from Title IV-A into Title I, uh, pending, of course, your own vote to approve that transfer. Ms. Elliott, do we have any speakers? Um, what questions might you have that I might be able to clarify? Any clarifying questions before we, before we take a motion? Ms. Yes. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you so much because I love it when we find money. So yes. that's really good. We like found money. It's a good thing. It's, it's a good thing. <laughs> and then um, it, it seems as though we're doing this. I had a question about whether or not this could be used for something else, but it seems as though this is going to be replacing funding that we might have otherwise lost. Did I understand you correctly? When once transferred into another grant, the monies completely follow the regulations of the grant that they've been transferred into. So these then will operate 
totally under Title I at, uh, following all of the Title I criteria and regulations, no longer following the Title IV regulations. And replacing monies that, did I hear you correctly, that we may, may we have, did we uh, lost. experienced a reduced allocation in Title I okay. after um, the start of the year and plans had been made. So yes, these would help uh, offset that reduction. Thank you. Then I will not ask my question, understanding that. And I would you like happy. to make a motion? Yeah. I would. Yes. Oh, if oh, a question, sure. Mr. Goldstein. Mr. Goldstein I can do it before or after. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm sorry. So there's a little bit of urgency about doing this, right? The, the, the this we is need to uh, get done sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Your approval is one step in a process of several steps involving. Um, different aspects of applying for the grants and, and getting approval from VDOE on using them within Title I. Uh, so there are a number of steps to follow this one um, before we're, we're actually able to utilize the funds. The funds are to be utilized the school year, including this summer, so they can be spent through September. So hey, um, that would be the source of the urgency. Yeah, thanks. Uh, normally, I like to have um, a separation between uh, info and uh, action items so there's time for the community to absorb it and understand and possibly give input or pushback or whatever but um, I think in this case I'm happy to uh, approve it tonight since it is found money and we do have that urgency thanks thank you some things you just want to jump on excellent thank you Mr. Goldstein may I have a motion I'm happy to offer this motion. <laughs> I move that the board approve the ESSA Title IV Part A application for award year 2017-2018 as presented and authorize the chair to sign the application. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. And with that, thank you very much, Ms. Coburn and Dr. Naturis. And with that, thank we you. are adjourned.